Hi, everybody. Welcome to our 2022 McClatchy Symposium. I'm Janine Zakaria, and I'm the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Lecturer in Stanford's Department of Communication. This year's topic is reporting about or reporting for how journalists cover working class Americans. And before we begin, I want to say thank you to the McClatchy family, as always, for sponsoring this annual symposium. I've had the great honor of moderating several of these during my decade at Stanford, and I always look forward to the opportunity. I want to also welcome our students, both current and alumni who I know are tuning in, members of the Stanford community, as well as members of the broader public for whom this may be their first uh, McClatchy Symposium. So a few housekeeping items. I apologize that we can't see Heather and Candace um, spaces yet, but I'm hoping that's gonna be quickly resolved with some technical support in the department. Um, I'm gonna be in conversation with uh, our, our three panelists for about 40 minutes, and then I'll begin to integrate your questions. Feel free at any time to enter a question in the Q&A function in the Zoom window. And I know the panelists are eager to hear what's on your mind, so don't be shy, especially my students. And before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to offer a bit of background or framing on our topic today and what I hope that we'll be able to achieve in the next hour or so. Back in 2018, Jay Hamilton, Stanford's Hearst Professor of Communication and Chair of our department, co-authored a paper with Fiona Morgan entitled, Poor Information, How Economics Affects the Information Lives of Low-Income Individuals which explored how information is produced for, acquired by, and utilized by low-income people in the United States. And among the findings were, one, that low-income people spend less on news and information, subscriptions and whatnot. Two, they're less likely to vote, and there's evidence in the paper that what that means is they aren't targeted with political information. Three, they have less broadband access, so when you're looking at all the free content on the web created by social media, their voices are less likely to be heard. And four, there's a bias in terms of the incentive to create content for them, or perhaps a bias for creating less. So today what I want to do is I want us to dig deep into some of these problems and that these findings reflect, and the answers our panelists are actually working on. So bring a sort of solutions lens to some of these problems. And along the way, we're going to explore some of journalism's fundamentals and how they're being questioned and reconsidered in today's age when there's a whole segment of the population that's underserved with essential information. In a nutshell, what is the goal of journalism when it comes to reporting on lower income individuals or the working class? So I see four, maybe five baskets. One, which stories get told and which information are we conveying? Two, how do they get told? How is this information provided? Is it a 2000 word narrative or a text message? Three, who gets to tell these stories? Do you need to be from these communities to be the journalist or can someone from the outside come in? Fourth, who's the audience? Is it the workers, the low income workers themselves or is it the policymakers who draft the laws that impact their lives, whether it be about wages or taxes? Do we need both? And fifth, most provocatively perhaps, how has journalism through its own storytelling failures and shortcomings had a role in perpetuating poverty? So joining us to unpack all of these questions are three outstanding journalists. First is Heather Bryant, Interim Executive Director of Tiny News Collaborative and Deputy Director of Product for News Catalyst, both of which work to help news organizations transform themselves into sustainable digital businesses. She was a John S. Knight Fellow here at Stanford, I believe in class of 2016, 2017. Next, we have Candace Fortman, Executive Director of Outlier Media. And again, I hope you'll get to see both of them soon in the video. The Detroit-based service journalism organization, and Candace, I want us to explain what that means, service journalism, that identifies, reports, and delivers valuable information to empower residents to hold government and officials accountable for longstanding problems. I had the privilege of being with Professor Hamilton when Sarah Alvarez was pitching the initial idea for Outlier Media as a JSK fellow right here in McClatchy Hall where I sit. And Candace herself was one of the first JSK Community Impact Fellows two years ago. Unfortunately, with COVID, we haven't had her physically yet here. And unfortunately, we don't have her video yet, but we will. Candace is, quote, a dynamo on how to help communities get what they need, as JSK fellow director Don Garcia told me. And finally, we have my good friend, Farah Stockman, an editorial board member at the New York Times. 
and author of American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. Farah and I were both covering the State Department in the mid 2000s, Farah for the Boston Globe and myself at Bloomberg. Um, so we both have that foreign policy background, but here we're talking about a topic that she's delved into in a major outstanding work of reported journalism. So as we get started here, why don't we go to all of you? I'll start with you, Heather, if you can hear me and are able to at least get your audio working. Before we start our, our own reflections on all of this, I want to define our terms, okay? So when we talk about the working class Americans, who are we talking about? Um, can you hear me? I'm hoping that yeah, my audio- Yeah, we can is hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to have this conversation because it is one we need to be having uh, much more frequently and in depth. Um, so with regard to the terms talking about working class, talking about poor, um, these are terms that have not evolved the way that they've needed to evolve. Like uh, the definitions that are being used are outdated. Working class used to be a term that was meant to encompass a very specific type of job that was industrial and manual and unskilled labor. And that is not really, that is not kept up with the nature of work, the nature of gig work, um, jobs that people are holding that are not full-time jobs, but they may be holding several of those jobs. Um, it's an outdated term, the, the, the perception that goes along with this term working class has not actually kept up with the situation that, that most people find themselves in now, because it's possible to hold a job or hold several jobs and still not be able to make ends meet. Um, so this is a, a, a challenging area to, to define really. Um, when it comes to the term poor and what does it mean to be poor, again, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but the simplest way I look at it is it's a state in which you are always having to do without something that you need or having to delay or having to juggle those needs. And what makes these things so difficult to put into a neat container is that economic hardship is not necessarily observable. It's mutable and it can be anywhere on the scale from temporary, which you know the majority of people in the US are going to experience economic hardship at some point in their life by the age of 60, or it can be something that's a lifetime or intergenerational. It doesn't fit into any clearly definable box and it's accompanied by a lot of stigma, which makes it a difficult area to to neatly contain and neatly package up for conversation and to actually address you know, issues around it. Candace or Farah, do you want to weigh in too on this question of how we define our terms? Candace? One, I think Heather hit, hit it right out the park. I don't think that it really needs additional um, detail, but I would say this is that one of the things that you know our work here at Outlier really focuses on when we talk about um, people who are in poverty are folks who are in poverty and they cannot pull themselves out. So there are times in life where you face economic hardship and you can do something in your own life. You can change your budget, reduce how you spend, change how you spend, and you can pull yourself out of that position. Many of the people that we are working with are dealing with very systemic poverty, the kind of poverty that is about how a community operates, how a community treats its people, and also the policies that are presented um, that keep people in those um, sort of cycles of poverty. So I just want to add that little caveat there. And Candace, when we talked before this, um, as we were preparing, I just loved your description of the target demographic. I wondered if you could share that with uh, the audience when you talked about that person whose cognitive load is high. Yeah. So I've been using this sort of example in my head and I learned this when I worked in commercial radio. Commercial radio does this thing. Commercial media does this thing where you define an audience and it's P1, P2. And in my brain, when I needed to really think about the people I most wanted my work to serve, I needed to come up with my P1 audience. So my P1 audience in my brain, the person I'm always thinking about is a single mother who has two children who works at Burger King. And I don't know why I chose Burger King. I just did. Um, and when I think about what her day is structured like, the kind of information, the time she has to take in information, the ways in which she can take that information in to make it useful for her life and for her children, um, I take everything through that lens that we created Outlier and even the work I do outside of Outlier. Am I reaching her? And if I'm not reaching her, then we have a real problem. You talked about, she doesn't have time, that mom, right. but she doesn't have time for a 2000 word narrative, no. the kind of thing that Farah and I might write <laughs> for mainstream papers. She's got a, what you said, information she can make moves on. What did you That's mean right. by that? What does that mean? Actionable information. So very easily digestible information. I can read this and immediately understand what number I call at the city to get help, what, um, what services are available for my children, what hours they're opened. 
Does the website actually work? The information that can help me actually move my life ahead. Once I get my life ahead, I can start giving into 2,000 words, 1,000 words, and really thinking um, further about these things. And this is not a, 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 we think about this, I think, too often as a matter of education level or intellect. It's not about education and intellect. It is about the capacity that you have to take on more information, because I can promise you that that woman has a higher cognitive load day to day. She's making more individual decisions than I make any day of the week because I have all these extra things to help me make decisions. All of these extra people and extra resources to make decisions. And so when I think about her, I'm thinking about something, someone who is constantly having to make choices. Many of those choices are um, about thriving or surviving. So she's trying to survive in a place, trying to survive a city. Um, a particularly a place like Detroit, which has its own unique um, issues when it comes to trying to survive. Par, when you think about the definition, do you think about it similarly? And also, obviously, you're coming to a different kind of audience, right? With your book about people who work at unions and, you know, the kind of target audience of the New York Times. Yeah, so my book was about uh, three factory workers in Indianapolis who's plant moved to Mexico and I followed them over four years. Um, so I really did take an educational definition um, because uh, to me there was, their stories really reflected this huge divide between people who had four-year college degrees and people who didn't, um, which was something that I hadn't, um, I hadn't uh, experienced before. I hadn't really had a chance to think about it before, but, you know, so many of their stories were about how people used to be promoted off the fact of, up from the factory floor up to management in their father's day. But now you had to have a college degree to be management. Now they were getting these kids straight from college to come and be oversee them, you know? And so it, it, t there was so much resentment uh, of uh, that class of people who were book smart or quote, credentialed by universities, but who actually didn't know how to run the machines. And so, you know, I, it, 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 to me, it was almost a cultural thing too. Um, you hear a lot about people, people who shower after work instead of before work, you know, the notion of blue collar versus white collar because this was an industrial setting and it's true those jobs are a lot of those jobs are going away but um i really focused on that notion of working class blue collar which is very different than poor um uh, poor, you know poor people uh to 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 the factory workers that i followed were were uh, were what to what they wanted to avoid right they wanted to avoid uh, falling into that class of people who had no institution taking care of them. And um, so that that's where I ended up. For when you wrote your book, um, you write very personally about your own privilege. And when you set out to uh, examine this Rexnard factor, factory in 2017 after Trump's election and see what happened to these three characters, three people, you wrote you know, for 20 years, I spent my spare time thinking about the livelihoods of poor people in Kenya. I didn't pay attention to the livelihoods vanishing in my own backyard. Talk about that understanding that you came to and how it changes the way you think about blue collar or working class reporting, reporting on that community now. I will, but first I just want to say in solidarity with Heather and Candace, I feel like I should <laughs> be very still so that I... I, I... <laughs> we will both, we will both should so that uh because I'm the only one on video here um yeah I honestly class is one of those things that um we didn't talk a lot about in my household my mother is black my father is white we talked about race constantly but class was just something I had not uh thought a lot about um uh, growing up I'm and I'm the child of two PhDs both, both yay <laughs> All right, Heather. Cool. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Got Candace. Yeah. Hello, Candace. Hello, Heather. Great. Thank you to the tech support in the comm department. 
So yes, you were saying class, you, you talked about, you didn't talk, which one did you we, talk we about? We talked a lot about race, but we didn't talk a lot about class. And I think in, in the United States, a lot of people like to pretend it doesn't exist. You know, like it's all about merit. It's all about, you know, just go to college and you'll be okay. And we just don't, we don't really grapple a lot with how, um, how uh, class is replicated uh, and passed on and how and all of the ways that um, credentialing of universities kind of blesses this notion that the people who get ahead deserve to be ahead. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I really had said one of the most shocking statistics that I, that I came across in my reporting of uh, of this book was the num was the percentage of American adults who don't have a four year college degree. It's what, what I mean. What would you guess, right? Like most when I ask people this question, how what percentage of American adults do you think have a four year college degree? A lot of people guess really high numbers, and so did I. Uh, like. A lot of people assume that it's the norm to have a four-year college degree, and two-thirds of American adults do not have a four-year college degree. So if we were a tribe, people with college degrees would control almost everything in this country, like almost every seat in Congress, every uh, Supreme Court justice, obviously, every editorial board, and, and you know every president since 1953. And yet we are a minority in this country. And, it, and it, it's just, it's one of these things that's almost invisible because everyone you know and everyone, you know, your spouse, your neighbors, it's one of these things that uh, at least in my, I had to really challenge myself and say, how many people do I interact with on a daily basis who do not have college degrees? And am I really seeing America? Right? Or am I just seeing this tiny slice of, of the country? Yeah, that's interesting. So I want to, yeah, I want to follow up on that because perhaps many of those people without college degrees, the vast majority, right? I mean, so, you know, those are the people that perhaps Professor Hamilton's referring to that maybe aren't inclined to have 27 newspaper subscriptions like I do, what I do for my living, right? And so, Heather, you told me something very interesting about we need two things for a healthy society, right? Healthcare and quality journalism, and both in this country are based on whether you can pay for it. So, how do we how do we deal with that problem, in your view, given the work you do? Um, yeah, this this is a this is a longer project that I've been I've been working on for some time with my writing partner Shady Revolver. We've been looking at this question of these two institutions in society, healthcare and journalism. And once you start doing that, it's very easy to go down this insane rabbit hole of all of the parallels between healthcare and journalism. There are so many. And it really comes down to if you want to have a healthy functioning population, access to healthcare is one of them, but also access to factual contextualized information is the other thing that is required to do so. When you put either of those things behind a cash register, you automatically have impacted dramatically the health of your society because you've created circumstances in which only certain people are able to access the thing that they need in order to appropriately navigate their own circumstances. Um, and I think we're having these conversations. We've not gone far enough with these conversations and they're ongoing. Um, the past few years, you know, that's been, you know, the thing, like, what does it mean to have healthcare be paid for an in, by an individual? And what is the impact that that has on the individual and their ability to participate in society? We need to have those same conversations about what does it mean for access to quality factual information, be dependent on the ability to pay in advance or pay at the point of access to that information. Because we're seeing what happens when people do not have equitable access to information in order to navigate their own circumstances. Um, and I don't know that we've been willing to be willing to think enough outside of our preconceived notions of what does it mean to pay for the work of doing journalism. Pretty much any time I talk about the idea of making journalism free to access, I will immediately have 40 journalists in my mentions telling me I'm not going to work for free. Well, we've also talked about making healthcare affordable, but no one has said that meant we're not going to pay doctors either. There are ways to pay for things that we need to explore and experiment with and collaborate with our communities to experiment with 
in order to serve them. And I think we're at a very interesting point in time in which journalism is finally willing to entertain the idea of uh, the opinions and the thoughts of the communities we're trying to serve in terms of how journalism works, which is quite fascinating to me. Healthcare and journalism have been around for a very, very long time, but if doctors waited until about 20 years ago to say, oh, maybe we should talk to people about what their symptoms are before we treat them, we would all be appalled by that notion, but it's only been in the last 20 years or so journalists are like, maybe we should ask people what they actually need from us. And, yeah, and that's, Candace, that's really at the core, right, of what you're doing at Outlier, right? Yeah. Um, and so it, here is like sort of the base of this entire thing. It is impossible to serve people who have been underserved or purposefully unserved unless, so that means you don't know anything about this audience. We, I could, if I wanted to start a newsroom tomorrow for college educated people, I could pull so much data that I'd be swimming in it. The same data that I would need to start or Sarah needed to start Outlier did not exist is why we had to create it. And honestly, I'm glad that we had to do that because it also means that we were not creating um, a newsroom for you know folks who fit the category of people we wanted to serve, but they live somewhere else. They lived in New York or California because poverty and low, uh, and low wage in New York is very different than it is in Detroit. It's very different than it is in Iowa or Kansas, right? And so it really means that I need to be able to sit in audience in, in concert with my community and ask them what it is that they need. And so we, you know, of course at Outlier, we start with this information needs assessment where we text and we do text very purposefully because we are trying to um, remove that barrier barrier to access of the internet. Um, and so we ask you, if you had a reporter working with you over the next 24 hours, what would you have that person find out for you? We also look at public record information. So calls to United Way. What are people calling United Way and asking for help with? What are people calling the non-emergency the non 911 um, number and asking for assistance with? What are the calls that are coming into City Hall that we can FOIA? So when you're able to look at that sort of public information and also ask people very directly what it is that they need in order to be a more informed population and when we talk about informed, um, it is not what most of us think about, right? So, so much of news for us is about entertainment. Um, even when it's very serious, it's about entertainment. Um, information as a source of entertainment, as a source of becoming smarter, of one-upping people. The folks that we work, we're working with are people who need information in order to survive. That word survive will come out again and again because if I can't get you to the thriving level information if you're not surviving. It, they don't, why would I care, you know, about, um, you know, the latest poll in the governor's race if I can't feed my family tonight? It doesn't matter to me. Um, and so if I want Detroiters to be more politically engaged, if I want to look at the numbers of people who vote in Detroit and see higher numbers, I have to first start by figuring out why they are disengaged and they're likely disengaged because they're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, talk about, you know, Candace, while we're talking about this, give us, give the audience an example, maybe the fake landlord scam sure. or, you know, that was really yeah. big on NBC. I mean, talk about how yeah. that, you know, you did make it to a bigger audience too. Sure. Yeah, so the model of Outlier is situated where first we start with this text message service, right? So people can text Detroit to a short code and they can get automated reported information 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those beats of reporting that are in that text message system, that it, we create those with those information needs assessments. So they change over time. So about every six months, they change to fit the information needs of Detroiters for that time. You can imagine that over the last two years, those beats have changed a lot because as COVID has ebbed and flowed, as money has ebbed and flowed, have, um, so have the needs of Detroiters. So you start there, right? So I can get you immediate information. Where can I go today to get food for my family? How do I save my family's house from tax foreclosure right now? So that's that information that keeps you, you know, safe and secure. Then we also have a newsletter product like every other newsroom in the country, right? And that newsletter product is about communicating what we're learning in that tech system to folks who actually have the capacity to make changes, people who run nonprofits, people who are policymakers, um, the mayor, the city council, right? The people who can actually help to make those changes happen. So the story like, story like what you're talking about, um, the NBC fake, fake landlord story came directly from our text message system. Because in that system is always the option to speak directly to a reporter in our newsroom. And so over time, when you have a number of people coming to you with the exact same problem, I 
been paying rent in this house. They told me that if I paid my rent, eventually I would own this house. And on the last payment, they disappeared. That is a systemic issue that was mostly impacting people who could not afford to use the general ways that you and I would walk into a mortgage company and buy a house. They were trying to secure their futures using the methodology that they had in front of them, right? This is a cat. Detroit is a cash economy. We have a new guide out called how to buy a house in cash, because that is how you buy a house in Detroit. You're not going to pull a mortgage at Quicken Loans, even though Quicken Loans is the largest mortgage broker in the country, right? And so in order for us to make sure that we're reporting for folks, we need to understand what are those issues that they're facing. That service is available, by the way, in English, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and so from there, we can do investigative and accountability journalism when we can't easily answer the question for people. I so love it. If, it's such a, it's such a yeah. reporting tool that, yeah. you know, and I think about sort of privileged reporting of like when you source on Twitter, like, hey, looking for people who blah, 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 that doesn't work when you're dealing with the fake landlord scam. No. Like and also, there, Twitter, and and also Janine, there's a, you know, a real sense of embarrassment. People. Yeah are ashamed that they have fallen for this scam. It's what makes this work so hard. Um, mm -hmm. People who have already been taken advantage of so many times over, then find themselves in this place. And so when that source allowed us to tell her story, she was risking a lot, right? That's her actual life. That's mm -hmm. her actual reputation. And uh, when people trust you with that story, that means that you have to do good with it. That's you have true. to make it count for everybody else that also is too embarrassed to tell that story. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the building the trust. That's something I talk a lot about in my classes of these people. Um, you know, you know, thinking about Heather, you're reporting in Alaska at one point and Farah, you had to go into this community that you didn't know well and you found these people to invite you in for years, right? And how do you get them to trust you, you New York Times lady, you know? Like, what'd you do, Farah? Oh, you're talk okay. yeah, yeah, I'm talking, okay. I'm talking, yeah. And then, then Heather, we'll come back to Alaska after or, um, or whatever point on that, but the building the trust, because it's so critical it, to doing this work well. Yeah, I mean, I had to go back uh, time and time again and would start it off like, okay, let's go to Cracker Barrel for lunch. And then, okay, I'm going to church with you. Okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go to your family reunion. Like it took years. <laughs> And it took, by the way, it took years for me to even uh, get a, a very basic idea of what, how their lives worked, of what the job that they were losing meant to them, because it's not something you can just get in a, in a quote. It's not a soundbite. It's, it's literally just seeing how many people depend on them or, you know, the sort of uh, intangible things that the job meant. It was a social stat. It was like a, a social symbol, a, a status symbol. You, you know, you could see people being envious of them because they had this job at a factory that was that paid twenty five dollars an hour, or you know, you could see that it was a family heirloom because you learned that they got their job from their uncle who had you know. And it just took a lot of time and hearing story after story after story. And most reporters don't have that kind of time. And so, you know, it, that's why it is so valuable to have reporters from those communities and people like Candace who are out, who are, who are out there looking because, you know, if you parachute in there without an open mind, you know, even if you do have an open mind, you don't have the time to find those stories. Um, so it, yeah, the building trust is really important, but I will say one other thing is that I would not have any of them see the story about themselves for the first time in the printed word. I went back to them and said, is this, is this what you were thinking? Is this how it was? And I had to, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, um, I didn't want them to feel ever taken advantage of because of the power dynamic of being a reporter and dealing with people who haven't dealt with reporters before. Heather, you wanna follow up on this building trust question? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, my my approach to it has been from the perspective of, you know, I'm 34, I've spent two thirds of my life in deep poverty. I grew up in deep poverty and then the last third working in journalism. So my experience in this space is 
having spent a significant portion of my life being harmed by journalism that did not know how to serve me or my family. And that affected how I have approached the work that I've done, which has been to ensure that the work that I do is not with people as objects of a story, but as partners in the story itself, as people who have agency, as people who should be benefiting the work that I do. Uh, and I think that has been a really key part of it because I know what it means to be harmed by journalism that does not take into account my life or my circumstances or the way that that work is going to impact me. And that's one of the, the you know, the things that we focus on with Tiny News Collective. It's about changing the nature of ownership of journalism and media in the United States because more people should have that ability to participate and build and structure the way journalism is going to function in their communities as opposed to being exposed to sort of like parachute journalism or people who don't know what it means to try to survive in a place or in a set of circumstances that they've never shared. Um, I want to really, this is now we're jumping ahead. To, I'm sorry, I'm jumping out of my order of our five points, but this number five about the, how journalists perpetuate the harm or how you were harmed by it. And I want both, you know, you and, and Candace to talk about that. Cause I know Candace, you explained that you, you schooled me in this when we were talking ahead of this. So Heather, can you, do, is it, can you talk a little bit more about that? How you felt harmed by it? Uh, sure. I we we did not pay for the local newspaper because there was nothing in that paper that did anything to help us there was nothing in there that was going to help no utility us. was the word there was I no utility yeah there was no benefit to it and at parts of my life my mother was a victim of domestic violence there were times when the local newspaper was actually a threat to her safety for reasons um, as many victims of domestic violence experienced, she had troubles with alcohol when she was arrested for dui they published our entire home address in the paper which was not something that was previously available. And that put us in danger. What utility was there for anybody to have our home address published in full in the paper? None, yeah. Yeah, Candace, do you wanna follow up on this history of the responsibility of journalists in perpetuating this problem, poverty? Sure, so everything we do in this life, it should be about intention. We should set out to do our jobs with some intentionality. Um, and too often, journalism's intention is self-serving. Um, my awards, my ad sales, um, my ability to make it up the ladder, right? As opposed to setting an intention that you are going to bring care to a community, that you're going to bring um, better understanding of a community to itself, right? And often that is about making sure that the folks who are in that newsroom are themselves representative of the people that you are attempting to serve. But I think, so that's one thing, right? But also there is also this thing where the intention is not to serve those folks. The intention is not to even consider them as a part of your possible audience. When I think about a city like Detroit, which is nearly 80% African-American, um, a city that is the largest poor city in the country. Um, and I think about the number of editorial resources available in this city and those things still remain true. This city still remains in poverty with two daily papers operating every day, two public radio stations available to hear and a number of digital startups. And yet that poverty number is not changing. For me, that's a problem. So as the executive director of a news organization, part of my intention in being a part of this job is to become a part of the solution to that problem. Because the folks that I serve are not just characters in a story. They're not just some unknown audience. They are the people who raised me. They are my aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and people I care about very deeply. Um, and so I cannot separate this idea of this place that raised me from the intention of trying to make sure that generations of Detroiters have something better than what I grew up in and certainly what exists today. And a lot of that is about providing good reporting, but also more importantly, making sure that we can actually provide the kind of a reporting that is incredibly expensive to do, which is investigative reporting focused on um, those folks who sit under or at the poverty line. But there's something historically that you think has gone awry in the way these communities have been covered, Candace, right? That mm -hmm. either the context that's been excluded, the approach, the people who have come in to tell the stories, right? That has, I mean, I remember you saying like has perpetuated it. It's yeah, like- Absolutely. So yeah. 
I, I mean, you know, I, 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 and I don't like to mix words with, the, with this, right? I'm, I'm pretty clear, right? That if we live in a country where white supremacy exists, then it cannot be ignored inside of the um, editorial bodies of the places where we live. And for, I see this most clearly because I have the, the privilege of having been raised in a place like Detroit. You can't really explain Detroit too many other ways than through the policy um, decisions that have happened that have ensured that the black population of this city remains in poverty by and large, right? You can look at redlining, you can talk to sociologists and they will all tell you the same thing. And so for me, then why isn't journalism and the journalism that is being created in the city reflective of what we know are these long-standing systemic um, issues mostly based on race. Um, and the folks who are running um, those papers over time, I'm not talking about just today, I'm talking about many, you know, through the years. Um, and I did come from a, a house that got the paper every day, and of course, until they went on strike. I also grew up in a union house. Uh, <laughs> but um, through the years, there was never an attention set that we could actually solve for these things that we can actually start to address them. And by addressing them, that means that we continue to tell stories until they actually start to shift something, right? You think about something like solutions journalism, that is literally the, what they do, right? You stay with an issue until something shifts. So continue this coverage, not episodic parachute, That's right. cover the riots, and, cover the whatever. Like, right, and not like, making, mm -hmm. so for instance, you have uh, what has become the walking man story in Detroit. It told the story of a man who was walking miles a day in order to get to his job. It was a huge we Sunday assigned, story. I signed it in my class. He got a of free car for board or whatever. It was amazing. Of course. I loved it. It was an incredible story. Mm -hmm. It changed his life. Exactly. There yeah. are still hundreds of people doing that same walk every day because we still have an outdated transportation system. And it mm -hmm. only impacts poor people because people who most people in the city have cars that can have a car. And because we don't actually care about those other hundreds of folks, we cared about the story, right? Like it was a good story. It was a feel good story. They put a GoFundMe up. He raised a bunch of money and immediately left the city. What did that do for anybody else who was living in that same reality? Mm -hmm. And there are thousands of people in that city living in that reality. Sarah, you want to jump in here in terms of this question well, of sustained coverage? Maybe how your own newspaper I, addresses I, this? I I am I just want I'm very honored to be in the presence of of two women who are who are believing that journalism can have solutions attached to it. I love that. Um, I I think often journalism is a reflection of society and not not um, uh, you know we are we're we're the same human reflection. Uh, and full of the same sins and blind spots as, as everybody else. And that's often the case. But in recent years, uh, we've had trouble keeping the doors open and the lights on because of the, the model, right? So when everything went digital, the ads that you could, you know, used to get for your, for, from your downtown, you know, uh, Macy's or whatever it was that Macy's kept the door open at the Boston Globe and I was there and newsrooms all over the country have been shutting down because they can't keep the lights on anymore so how do you keep the lights on you go behind a paywall and so you know it used to be that you you know you kept the lights on from uh, for, you know, classified ads and, and all this, you know, all this stuff and somebody could go and buy a, a, a paper for a quarter. Now the paper costs $6 or, you know, or just for that Sunday paper. Or So I think that the model itself, the funding model is, is really aimed towards people who can afford Forward to buy the paper, and that changes the coverage in a way because you're you're telling, you know, as much as you might uh, want to tell these stories of other people, your real customers mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. are folks that are that can pay. Right, and, and this is getting they're interested in. They're not necessarily people <laughs> can buy a paper for six dollars aren't walking to work. Right. Heather, I mean, this is the whole point of Tiny News Collaborative, right? Uh, and yeah, we're the 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 whole focus has been trying 
to equip people to build a new version, a new future of local journalism in their communities, not to prescribe what it looks like, not to prescribe how it functions or how they're going to do it, but give them a decent chance at starting and trying something different and to do it in their communities. And we don't require people to come in with journalism backgrounds to the idea of access to and creating and, and dispersing that in their communities and experimenting with their communities and how they're going to sustain that rather than just imposing ideas of, okay, you're gonna pay us this, you're gonna do that, but to give them space to try to figure out what it's going to look like to, to serve their community and to bring their community into their work. Candace, can you talk about documenters a bit and sort of how, you know, we're ex expanding the definition of who's going to be reporting, exp expanding the number of people who are doing this kind of accountability journalism? Right, because, I mean, to Farrah and Heather's point, it costs a lot of money to produce news. Um, and so part of the business model has to become about who are you going to produce the news with, who gets to produce the, the news. So Documenters is a program started by City Bureau in Chicago. Um, and we were fortunate enough in Detroit to be the second city to host um, a documenters team. Documenters are uh, uh, s uh, residents who are trained and then paid to go to public meetings and to take notes at those meetings that become a part of public record. Those notes are edited by editors in our newsroom and in newsrooms across the city from the free press um, to WDET, our public radio station, um, and then made accessible to anyone who might need to use them, whether it be for editorial purposes or just to better understand your community. They also operate, and I say they because I like to, they are their own function. They, they move, I just raise the money. Um, and so they also um, produce a, a weekly newsletter, which has become um, basically the digest of uh, City Hall in, in Detroit and an incredible digest of what's happening at the city council table at the water board meeting, um, at the land bank meeting and all of the meetings in between. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, so we're talking about this, I mean, it's such a great initiative, a documentary, people can read more about it. Where is it? Documenters.org, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really incredible. I wish I could put it up here. I don't want to mess with the screen. Um, the, uh, you know, we're talking about who gets to tell these stories, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, I'm going to put it out there, Candace. I asked you, I said, can I, Janine Zakaria, sitting here, you know, I spent 25 years doing this on the road, but yeah. I haven't, I don't, you know, and so I had to go to places around the world that I didn't know that well. I had to immerse myself. If I want to go to Detroit and I want to do a big series, you know, about poverty, what's going on in the working class. And you said, uh-uh, no. You said, I rolled my eyes at you, Janine. So let's talk about it. I, I mean, did. And, I'm sorry. And, and that's okay. I, it was so instructive to me that, that, you know, and, and what it made me think was, okay, so how do we get more Candace's in there then? That's know that, right. I think that's really what you were saying, right? I mean, Honestly. Yeah. That's part of my, my biggest battle was how do I keep young reporters in the city? Mm -hmm. How do I create access to great jobs, to, to great, um, resources for them to stay here, right? Because they were leaving because those resources didn't exist and also they weren't being hired. Um, so that's part of the issue is just retaining the talent that we naturally have here. Um, and that means paying them well, which also means getting funding, which is a whole, we have a whole other question conversation about um, the impact of funding on telling these stories. Um, but, you know, I said that because we've had in Detroit in particular, decades of people parachuting in to tell the story of Detroit. We've had series in probably every major paper in this country that was going to tell the story of the recovery, the renaissance, the, the, the fall. You, uh, you know, we, we, we went through the whole era where there was, um, we were people coming in, taking pictures of the abandoned plants and, you know, people were literally hosting tours, um, coming to the city to tour abandoned plants and abandoned homes. That did nothing for the people in this city. And in fact, it likely hurt our resurgence. And when we talk about resurgence, not the resurgence that happens in downtown Detroit, not Dan Gilbert's resurgence, not the Illages resurgence, but the resurgence of the actual people who call this place home, who pay taxes here, who send their children to school here, who are trying to raise families here. Um, and so as much as Janine, I think that you would be an incredible journalist to perhaps edit 
those stories. I don't know if you need to be telling those stories. All right. So at least I have some role, you know, on behalf that's some, right. We always need great. Editors. I want to be part of it. I want to be part of the solution. You know, that's right. That's um, right. I have a question here from my student, Grace, who's taking my reporting class right now. Candace, do you have a vision to scale up a service like Outlier News? Do you want it to become a public good? So yes. all, low, low, all low income American people have access to valuable information and news. And if it does become a public good, what does that look like? Um, Grace, you are a person after my own heart with that question. That is something that Sarah and I think about all the time when we think about the actual model for Outlier. So um, for us, Outlier is taking the place of what public media should be. We think this would be a better situation for public radio or public television to actually operate. Um, but here we all are. Um, and so trying to figure out how to make this a model that people can pick up and take, much like we pick up and took documenters and brought it here to Detroit is incredibly important to us. We helped to build a project um, called News 414 in um, Wisconsin, which is up and operating under our model to this day, um, uh, run by some really incredible people there. We built, helped them build the infrastructure. We did not do the reporting. It wasn't ours to do. I am not from Wisconsin. I cannot tell you what is going on there. Um, and so we would love to be able to work with more communities to do that. Um, but first we gotta scale up in Detroit. We have to be um, ready to fall into place the day that one of these daily newspapers goes away. And so for me, ensuring that Outlier is strong enough and has enough reporting um, uh, credentials and enough reporters and editors and, and infrastructure in order to be um, ready to take up more space if and when that time comes is actually more important to me now than trying to figure out a way to take Outlier to other places because I got to stay home first. I want to come back to this, how are you going to pitch for money for these kinds of initiatives, right? But there's a lot, there's a couple questions coming in about the source reporter relationship. And, um, you know, uh, one of our distinguished alumni, Caitlin Alapati, who also worked at Outlier before she came back to the Bay to work at the San Francisco Chronicle, she asked this smart question. The conventional relationship between source and journalist is dispassionate and ultimately not aimed to improve the source's circumstances. How are your organizations reimagining the transaction of information between reporter and source? We got a lot of Janet Malcolm echoes here throughout this conversation, but you know, Ted, I don't know where my journalist in the murder copy is. I'm looking for it. Anyway, so well, how do we, let's talk about that relationship, you know? Farrah, do you want, or Heather, or you want to talk and then, because you, you know, you probably think a lot about this, far when you're interviewing people, right? Well, so the woman that I uh, spent a lot of time with, um, for my book, um, she was taking care of a disabled child. She herself had a background of sexual abuse. She was a person who had, she didn't think of herself as a victim, but she had had so many uh, really tough things happen to her. And she didn't, you know, so she wasn't somebody who was going to pick up a newspaper to look for resources. But I mean, you know, I, there are some people who would say, oh, yeah, it's not your job to intervene. You're supposed to be a fly on the wall just watching. I'm not going to watch. So there was a point that I was like, OK, we can get let's start looking just because your grandchild is disabled doesn't mean that there's not a school that will take her. Let's call and find out. And I think, I mean, in a certain, I guess in a certain way, that is uh, the feeling of entitlement to information, the feeling of entitlement to services is a privilege. It's something that I, you know, it, it belongs to the people who were raised in a, you know, in a certain income level or a certain educational level. And Shannon just didn't, she didn't feel, uh, she didn't mm -hmm. feel like the government was there for her. She thought the government was, was, was going to take something away from her. It was a danger. It wasn't actually there to serve her. And, and so I think that that's, you know, when you look at the political divide in this country and the, and the way that some folks feel about government, you have to ask yourself, what have their experiences been 
uh, with the government that has caused them to come to this conclusion. You know, government comes to the door to take away your child or government comes to the door to put you in jail. They're not really, you know, uh, there to help you in, in a lot of situations. And so, yeah, I definitely- Are you saying, are you saying, Farrah, that you helped her navigate that? And yes, that well, I there, there were times, I'm not gonna take, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna take credit for this or that, but there were times that I was like, Shannon, let's pick up the phone and call because I think there's must be a program for your- granddaughter or I think there must be this or that and you know that I didn't pretend in my book that I didn't have sort of a friendship with these people by the end because you're not going to spend four years with people watching them struggle or watching them do this that or the other they gave me advice too right <laughs> um but yeah I think um I don't I won't I, I, I was there to tell a story but there are, I think I'm a human being and I wouldn't have, I, I think that, that as you, you disclose your relationship as you write it. And, and that was kind of the, 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 I wasn't just writing a straight news source, news piece pretending like I didn't care about these people. Well, it's different in a book, but it, it reminds me so much of the conversations we have in, in my foreign correspondence class. And you know, being a human, but you're also a journalist and you go into Yemen and people are starving and do you, do you give them food or does that corrupt the story in a way by giving, and do you give the food after and who gives the food or do you just alert the, the NGO that down the road, there's some people starving. Like what is your responsibility as the journalist in these situations? I mean, it's different, you know. It, yeah. I mean, no, I, I've been there too. I've reported, yeah. I, I've, I've reported in Kenya and Rwanda and a lot of places. And this goes back to that authenticity question of like, who can tell what story? And, you know, you can do more good sometimes by telling a story about people who need food and this needs to be delivered. And that's the that's what people tell themselves. You know, I mean, every situation is different and you do as you can. But I think about that that picture in the Vietnam War of the girl and she's naked on the, you know, on the uh, road and you just take the picture and leave. You know, I, I think he actually did go back and help her, but you know. Heather, do you want to weigh in on this uh, source relation, you know, responsibility to sources, relationship to sources? Um, yeah, there, there's there's a couple things that come to mind. I mean, this idea of distance from sources and not getting involved and not doing things, that's sort of been business as usual for journalism for a long time. So I'm just curious, is everybody happy with how that's worked out? Like, are we in a really good place now with journalism? Did that go well for us or anybody else? Um, and I don't think the answer to that is, is yes. Otherwise, we would be having a lot of different conversations right now. Um, I think one of the things that we always have to remember about is our presence in the lives of people who are experiencing hardship is not coming at their choice. We are like EMTs who show up to car accidents, and we've talked about this before, but odds are if you show up in somebody's life because they're experiencing these types of circumstances, they did not choose for you to be there. You are imposed upon them. And we could say they have the option to not talk to us, but do they really? They say, yes, they're gambling that we're not going to do badly by them. That's a risk for them. If they say no, the risk is that their story never gets told. People who have power or wealth, they never have to worry about their story not getting told. Someone is always going to want to tell their story or hear from them, but that's not true for people who are experiencing hardship or experiencing difficult circumstances. And that has a profound difference on, on the dynamic that happens. And I mean, if, if our job is to convey information to people and I am doing a story in which the person I'm talking to needs information and I, I cannot imagine saying, sorry, I'm not going to give you information in a one-to-one -one manner because I'm giving information to 10,000 other people you have to wait for that. I, I don't understand the what that accomplishes other than to make someone feel like they've had yet another terrible experience with the world of journalism and with people who are doing journalism. And I've done, I, I don't see the harm in helping people find information. That is, that is our job. That is the whole point of what we do. Mm -hmm. So Simone Stolzoff, one of our, uh, another uh, esteemed alumni along these points, what can journalists do to better honor their sources after a story publishes? I mean, that's a word I don't, I don't use often, but honor them in terms of, 
you know, and I, to me, I mean, just to take it on myself, I mean, I, you know, I think that's why we need more me, people like you've got to teach people all these how to do good journalism. I think the problem is we have so much bad journalism that it makes everybody, you know, think that every journalist is going to get them. It's going to be bad if they speak to that journalist. The whole point of it is to, to help people, right? If you're right, you want to write it. What are we doing here at the end of the day? You want to have stories that have impact and change lives, you know, if you're doing the good work. Now, not everybody's doing that kind of work, right? But hopefully their honor is that, that per there is a change. It's not like the guy gets the car and drives, drives his new Ford out of Detroit, Candace. Like, so I can see that failure more clearly now. Farah, you want to weigh in here on this point or? Well, I think I, I like the idea of follow-up. People have talked about follow-up and you can do that with individuals as well. Um, some, uh, even if you parachute into a place, you can follow up over time. How are you? And, and did, did, did this change? I, some, you know, some, there's some good, uh, there's some good, uh, examples of journalists who have gone back to the same people over years. Let's say political reporting is super guilty of like parachute in, you get a little quote that says, you know, what you already think and you cherry pick that quote and go away. Um, but uh, the, best, the antidote to that is to keep going back and saying, you know, what do you think now? How did this really change? And what you, you, you deepen your understanding of what this person's worldview is and what's impacting it. And so that's one way to, I don't know. I guess the, the, the issue I have with some of this is if you are helping someone or you're you buying, you know, buying them groceries and you're 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 helping them find their whatever. And then they may say, wow, this person's really helping me. Like I need to do whatever they want. I'm gonna have to say whatever they want for this story. Like I need them to keep working with me. Or, you know, one of our alumni who did a fantastic story followed a homeless guy in LA for two for two years, Jackie Botts. And like she she got very, you know, she was telling my class the other day about how it's like you get very involved with this person and then like. You got to call the, you got to, you know, it's a big responsibility, right? And how does it change the storytelling? I've got to ask this question though, from a poverty reporter here who wants to know about compensation and whether primarily for Candace and Heather, does the question of compensation for subjects come up in your work? I didn't think it would, but I don't know, maybe, you know. No, we operate under the same um, ethics guidelines as any other newsroom. I will say one thing that we are, I think, more thoughtful about is when can we actually have the person tell this story for themselves? So for instance, there is a story that we did actually, Catlin, who you mentioned earlier here, um, had a big hand in that story. So we worked with the Detroit Free Press to tell a story about tax foreclosure in the city. Sarah Alvarez and Catlin wrote the actual data story with all of the you know, fancy journalism. And then we had a um, person who had used our service and found us through the tech system actually write an op-ed that ran alongside the reported piece. So you got the data story, you got the straight up here, what the numbers look like, here's the conversation for policy folks, but then also here's me as a human telling you what it feels like to live inside that data. To see those two pieces together was much more um, influential than to see just the data story or even just the op-ed. And we did pay her to write that op-ed. She then turned around and redonated the money back to us to start a fund for other freelancers. So it, you know, there you go. Um, I got a question here from a person named Patrick Golden who says he's not one of the esteemed alumni. I just like calling on my, you know, people who graduated and my students try to give them some, but I, I you know, Patrick, if you want to ask a question, I'm here for you. So one of the questions you asked, but he's, he's criticizing the panel for say, making it seem like, is this just a, an exercise in this sort of elite reporting that I'm trying to criticize, but by us just talking amongst ourselves, um, but Patrick asked, you know, he says he's an unemployed person. So I'd love to hear a, a question for you that, you know, we can address. One of the questions you did put in the chat, Patrick, is where do you all get your news from on a daily basis for updates on local, national, and global events? Heather, what's your, what's your daily news diet like? Uh, slim lately because of work, but so there's some local news organizations around me that I follow and then I keep up a lot through like NPR and BBC and I tend to stay on the public media side of things when I can, that usually is a lot of it, but I try to mix it up when I can. Candace? Um, I'm a public media alum, so public I've spent a lot of time with public media and also with some of the local startups here, especially for local government coverage. Mm -hmm. What about you, Farah? 
Well, I cover foreign affairs issues. So yeah, I look at Wall Street Journal, uh, the Post, the Times, and I also try to get uh, to see how people in other countries are writing about what's happening in their countries. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I guess I can add to this though, because my community has a listserv mm -hmm. and it might be the most informative thing in my life um, because I feel like those, you wanna talk about sourcing, I don't know who their sources are, but they mm -hmm. can find out that something is moving through that city council table faster than anybody else. Um, there's a little lady in my community named Diane. And if you wanna know something about what is happening at the city council table, Diane might be the best source in the whole city. <laughs> All right, these are good tips. We have um, Aliyah Chavez from Indian Country Today, and she says, the panelists have shared that producing news that is easily digestible for their audience is beneficial for those who don't have the capacity to read or listen to long form journalism. What are tangible ways to make your writing and reporting, quote, more digestible in a way that benefits your audience? I like this. Any of you want to jump on that one? So like yeah, practical tips to replicate. You know? um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that, that is a bit more straightforward and is sometimes we look, we overlook it so easy is like just answer the question, what does it mean to do X in my community as a person with limited means? And just explain that, like answer that question. It doesn't need to be this extremely long back history of the thing. Just tell people how to navigate different circumstances through the lens of someone without means and make it practical and useful. Um, sometimes journalism seems to look down this idea of educating people on how to make use of their own community, but a lot of people need help figuring out how to make use of their own community and their resources. And Heather, uh, what are some of those? What are those how-tos that are underreported right now? Like maybe we'll have, we'll just brainstorm, let's do like a news pitch session here. Like, what are we failing to cover? How to register to vote? I think there's a lot out there right now. How to get your benefits for X, you know? Absolutely, yeah. The, I actually did a medium post. It was like 104 questions of things of how to do this in your community and answer this through the lens of like economic hardship. Well, like, you have where, like, yeah. where, where is the benefits office? Like, how can you get there? Where, what are the phone numbers? How do you sign up for different services you might be eligible for? How do you check your eligibility for different services? Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, how do you navigate these things? How do you use transportation? What is, you know, is there, um, you know, what are, what are local public jobs? What are the educational opportunities? There's a lot of things in a community that you can calibrate around and just answer basic questions of like, how do I get to work? How do I, you know, find out what I'm eligible to make use of in this community? Love it, love it. Candice, yeah. I think if we keep in mind that news and information can be two different things. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at your newsroom as a place that also produces information for people. So one, can you make it easily readable? How many steps can I break it down in? Can I do it in three steps, right? Can I make it an infographic as opposed to having long form, like if I have a long form story and I needed to tell it long form, can I also add an audio component where maybe a person can listen to it while they're on the bus or while they're driving or while they're doing dishes or you know, chasing kids. How do we make it so that folks can actually live their lives and also digest information? And I think even if you're doing long form reporting, how can you pull out the most important parts of that? I understand that we want folks to scroll down and spend time on our websites and all of that SEO. But what we mostly want people to do is to be able to once again, I'm gonna say it again, survive. Now, okay, this is all one kind of information providing and essential, but I, I want to make the case for Farah for the the big here's how NAFTA failed this community, or here's, I mean, maybe there's a way to do it in a way that shows that all those promises about NAFTA, you know. Well, the people in that community already know it. They don't know. No, but I'm saying for the policymakers. For the policymakers. I need to be a bridge for the policymakers. They right? know too. I, well, know too. a lot of them. A lot of them, I, I really think that um, policymakers need to be educated on how their policies are impacting people on the ground. You don't, you don't, uh, it's not always easy to, uh, they don't always know, right? And, and no one really, really talks about it. You, we hear these huge bills, they move through Congress and, you know, it's not always clear what's in them. And then the fallout happens later when you when you learn 
how things, you know, how, how things are going to unfold on the ground. For instance, um, the the trade assistance, right? The trade assistance money that that's for laid off factory workers, people who lose their jobs uh, under trade. There um, was a provision that they will pay for something like seventy five percent of your health care if you lost your job through tr trade, but you had to front the money for the, the health care and then they'd pay you back at tax time. So like, I just want to find out how many people have ever used that? I bet not one, because if you lost your job, you don't have the cash to front the money uh, in advance. And like the, the, the whole notion that that was even in a bill that passed is, is crazy. You have you done that story like, yet? Have you done that one? Uh, I, it's in my book, but I'm just like, yeah, but like, to, are so, you yeah. people like, how did you even design a law like that? So many things are around um, taxes, right? Every that's the lever that they love to use, and it's like, you know, t it's really complicated to, but, you know, to, oh, just to file taxes and make the tax code work for you if you're a, a, a low income person. Candace, you want to follow your good. I was just going to say, that's also about, you know, when we talked about the definitions, right? If you've never been cash poor, cash poor is very different than anything else. If you cannot go into your bank account and physically pull money out, or you don't have a bank account. Yeah. The inability, and I, and I think most of our, unfortunately, most of our policymakers cannot understand what it feels like to be in that situation. They can't even comprehend that people are living without cash around them. Right. So that you might go a week from paycheck to paycheck and not have a dollar to your name. That is a real thing that is happening. So, of course, you think, well, just front the money, you know, pull it out your savings account. What savings account? What account? Where am I pulling this money from? But that's about how we. So when we talk about the harm of journalism. Right. So if you're not telling stories from that place, if the folks who are in the newsroom have not existed in that place. If no one in a newsroom has ever had to live like that. So they can't say to the editors, to the folks running the newsroom, maybe we need to tell this story differently. Then we end up telling the same story, but in the same way. So it makes no impact because we actually aren't diverse. We aren't using a diverse, the diversity of the folks around us in order to make sure that we can to actually bring impact to the story, to the storytelling. You, you talked, um... Candace, in a, in a, and I pulled the Medium post you wrote uh, when you were starting your JSK fellowship, and you said, I want to build a be better newsrooms that reflect the needs of communities left behind by the business models of traditional newsrooms. So how's that going? Is, there, is it working? Is there, are we, what can we do more to, to get these people that you're talking about in the newsrooms? I mean, I feel you got to start very early with interventions in sort of getting people to do this kind of work. Yeah? Yeah. There are many parts to that story and we could probably do a symposium just about that one question you just yeah. asked. Um, it is going. Um, I, I, I always, I say to people, Outlier started to actually get real funding when our funders found themselves in an information gap and that information gap was COVID. So for many of our funders who have never had to use information to make actual things happen to survive, they found themselves in their communities in that place. And all of a sudden the outlier may, model made a lot of sense. And so that is when the conversations about the, when the checks got much bigger. Um, I don't know how much longer people are going to care about what has happened over the last couple of years. And I know that much of our funding bump has been because of that. And so, um, you know, I'm throwing everything I can at the pot. And I do mean everything from, you know, foundations to individual donors to $5 donations from our community um, to, you know, community members who want to throw fundraisers for us in their backyards. Whatever we need to do in order to keep these lights on, I'm going to make it happen. Um, and so our revenue mix does not look like the Texas Tribunes, perhaps, right? Um, but what it hopefully will look like is that you will see our community reflected, maybe in really small ways, right? So maybe it's somebody saying, here, sweetie, here's a hundred dollar check, which happens sometimes to me, right? Um, that hundred dollar check matters as much to me as the, you know, $950,000 check we got from AJP, because that's an endorsement from my own community. 
So you mentioned um, the AJP, American Journalism. Yeah, the American Journalism um, Project. Project. So, yeah. you know, it is about finding the funders who understand what we're trying to build. But also, I think that we are fortunate enough, and I think Carla asked this question in the chat there a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I am not just saying I run a newsroom. I run a community organization. I run an information organization. Um, I run a civic in, or, um, organization because of documenters. Um, I employ folks that look like this community. Um, I employ folks that are all across the board in all sorts of ways. Um, and we're talking to people that other um, um, organizations have had a hard time reaching. And so I think I have a case of, for support that works. But the other issue is that I also don't come from wealth. And so often it is difficult for me to find myself in those doors. You know, I, I love when I do like major gifts training and people say to me, oh, well, you know, just identify the five people in your life who can make a major gift. Am I supposed to know five people who can make a major gift? And where did I fail in life? Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I don't have people around me who have gone to college. Everybody, in, almost all of my friends have gone to college and have not just one degree, multiple degrees. Mm -hmm. And none of them, not a single one of them could make a major gift to outlier. Now we can talk about generational wealth and the loss of black wealth in this city. And a lot of that would explain why I'm having a hard time attracting major donors to an organization like Outlier. So when we talk about that system, so when we talk about the harm that has been done, it impacts everything. Mm -hmm. it we becomes, have, yeah. Um, Sorry. I'm curious if the two of you take um, ad, ad revenue. No, no ad revenue. I'm not in a direct news organization right now. We're supporting news organizations. Some of our members are experimenting with that as local advertising though. But Heather, yeah. this, is, well, this yeah. is your bread and butter right now. Are you trying to sustain these newsrooms, right? Are these tiny newsrooms? I mean, what are the anonymous attendee asks? What are the foundations that should be funding nonprofit news outlets to reach low income populations? Why aren't they doing more? I wish I knew why they were doing more. If I had the answer to that question, um, we, this, would, this would be a, a much less stressful uh, area of work for me right now as to why they're not. Um, I, so our, our founders are experimenting with a variety of revenue models, and that's one of the things that we're trying to support because we don't know what is going to work in one community or the next, and we don't try to prescribe them doing, like everybody doing the same thing. So we facilitate them doing lots of different things so they can try it out. So they can do ads, they can do um, donations that are not tax deductible, they can do donations that are tax deductible, they can, we're their fiscal sponsor, so they can also take in grants and philanthropy as well. Um, they're doing sponsored newsletters if they wanna do sponsored newsletters. They're, they're trying different things. And so our job is to support them in their experimentation as they try to figure out what's going to work for their community and what's going to work for them as founders, um, as opposed to just imposing one you know, model for them. And we want to give them the space on the runway to do those experiments as, as long as they can to figure out what, what will work for them and what will work for their communities. So we got to, this might be a little from Professor Glasser asking about what role we can, you know, people working at universities, is there a role for us um, in studying the kind of solutions journalism you advocate, or, you know, maybe in my, I would add to Professor Glasser's question and training people to go into this or, and he asks if you're familiar with the public journalism movement of the 1990s, which is, has echoes of what we're living in now. But either way, in terms of, can universities do anything, journalism programs to, to, to right some of these wrongs? Well, who do you accept into your journalism programs? Professor uh, Hamilton, are you uh, on? <laughs> well, we accept, I mean, lots of different people of, of all kinds, people from all over. And what is the cost to attend? I don't have that number figured, Jay. So, but what we do offer very generous um, stipends, I know, and some, there is a lot of financial aid available. So- And I'm not picking on Stanford. Yeah, but in question, I'm picking question on the system. Like making it so it's an affordable yeah. education, preferably free, mm -hmm. is, is barrier number one. Where I come from, journalism is not a job that is an option for people. Jobs are things that give you calluses. This was not, an area of employment that I ever thought that I would end up in. I stumbled into this field of work. So, I mean, one of the things that I would love to see more ha happen more with higher education with regard to who gets into this work is to broaden the concept of where those folks are coming from and how you message this work to them and how you talk about the people who have done this work. Um, there have been a number of times when I've looked at university jobs and I've noted 
when they extol their professors and their faculty members for their decades or their time at the New York Times and the Washington Post, but the person who worked in local news for decades gets two sentences in their bio, that's noticeable. How you talk about the people who have been in this field also affects who thinks they could be in, end up in this field and whose work actually has value. Yeah, Tomas, one of our graduates as well, was talking about how do we better explain ge how geography is tied to class in reporting. And should that be considered more in journalism? He actually works in the, um, the U.S. territories of Guam and the Northern Marianas, and you know, this, there's a lot of intersections you're talking about. I mean, and I mean, so if we could go out though, Heather, and recruit more actively, um, I don't know, or Farah, and what if I we go into Indianapolis and we find these people and we say, you know what, you get a free ride at Stanford or Berkeley or Columbia or whatever? I mean, I almost feel like you're saying like. No, like just come and start working with us now here. You know, why come get trained by people like, you know, you know, you're thinking we don't even need it, is, is what you're saying. Yeah, Kansas is like, you don't even need what we teach. You need it. Mm -hmm. It is not the only way to get it. Yeah. So and I would all, never see alternative it. paths for others as well. Absolutely. It's not the only route into a newsroom. Mm -hmm. um, it is the easiest route. Um, but it shouldn't, and it shouldn't be the only route, right? Community colleges should also be a route. Training programs like the one that City Bureau in Chicago runs should be a route. Um, there are many ways to learn how to do this job. It is, you know, a, a, an incredibly important jo job, but it is not, you know, you don't have to cut anybody open, fortunately. Um, so, you know, it, it's teachable. Well, well I mean, Heather said it's like being a, like, well, the EMT analogy. So, all right, right. <laughs> Similar to being in the, well, anyway, different in different contexts. The degree right. in the professionalization of this field is recent. Like this, you have to have a degree to be a journalist thing. That is not a very old concept for this, this field. Of I didn't get a journalism degree, you know, but anyway, go ahead, Farah. Yeah, no, but it, it's, it is, you learn it by doing. And I do think that um, I think one of the things you have seen over the years, though, is that newsrooms like the New York Times are increasingly staffed with people who have not only college degrees, but Ivy League degrees. So I think there was a study in uh, 2018 that said 30 percent of the New York Times reporters and, and editors had Ivy League degrees. Um, and it's so your world gets so narrow when that's the case. And so uh, we've seen incredible diversity on, on the racial front, not enough, not nearly enough, but much more than, than let's say 20 or 30 years ago. And yet when it comes to educa the educational uh, front, it's, it's actually we're becoming more alike in a way. And, and I, I think, it's breaking our country. It is breaking our country because the separation between people who come to places like Boston and New York and, and DC and California, it, it's, it's because they're, they're almost in a different, I don't know, it's, it's a different universe in a way because of everything from social, your social networks, your your worldview, the stuff you the stuff you deal with every day. The I think the geography is is a real, I don't know, it's a real challenge for how we can still be a country and and understand each other and represent each other. Um, so I don't know. I feel like it really just goes to the heart of the social fabric and why so many people talk about the elites and they don't under, you know, they don't they don't deserve to run the country. So Farah, you're on the editorial board of the New York Times. It's one of the most powerful positions in mainstream journalism, okay? So if you went to Dean Baquet or somebody or whoever the editorial page, who, what's her name, the editorial page editor now? Oh, and you, yeah, and so we need, okay, we, we, need, we need geographic and class diversity on this page. I am challenging you to hire da -da -da number of people or Dean on the news pages. We only have like, we don't have anybody from the state of, Kentucky, I know probably of Kentucky, I don't know, but like, you know, so I don't know, some of this, maybe that needs to be pushed now the way, you know. There's been some efforts and there's been some efforts to like, to, to support uh, local journalism in, in various ways. And there obviously can be more and should be more, 
Um, uh, and there's also been some efforts to recruit uh, someone who doesn't have a college degree. I have heard it's a it's a rumor. That's, that would be interesting. I think it's we a should rumor, uh, but but it, it's it's a it's, rumor. It's one of these. Um, yeah, I it's 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 a it's tough. I I, I think. Um, let me not get in trouble because this is going to leave. All right. Mind. All right. Let's get, so we're going to wrap up. Um, four but minutes I do left. think, I think there, are, you know, I'm really inspired by what Heather and Candace are doing. And I think me that too. it shows that, you know, journalism is going to have a healthy future and it's going to live on because people are going to get creative. They're going to have to, because we need it. And so we're going to have to figure out, we're going to have to figure it out. And um, so, yeah, I, I would like them to talk a little bit more about how the kind of help that they could, that the people on this call, the participants, the, the kind of help they're looking for to grow their projects. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to end. We've got about three minutes. So either answering what Farah just said, or I think if we can leave this discussion with one or the most important practice that every legacy newsroom can adopt to address these information gaps in their communities. We've kind of just touched on one in terms of diversifying, not only in terms of race, but in terms of class and geography and getting those voices, opportunity, non Ivy League or whatever, you know. Um, or picking up with Farah, like with an appeal or something that can be useful. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Heather or Candace, do one of you want to go first? Uh, I'll go. Um, leave, yeah. leave your newsroom. Walk out of the doors of the newsroom and go into your community. Not to go tell a story, mm -hmm. not to go find a source, to exist in community. Uh, one of the most remarkable things I watched in, in working in a newsroom was watching someone who worked in that newsroom every day uh, get on the freeway from their suburban community, go down the freeway, get into the parking garage, go into the door of the newsroom, maybe go out for a smoke break, get back in their car, get back on the freeway and go back to their suburban community while trying to ex tell the story of Detroiters mm -hmm. um, who are not in that newsroom, right? By and large. And so figure out how you can actually be in in community with the folks that you're reporting on. I understand the ethics. I get it. I really do. Um, but there is a way, and, and, and I always find the ethics funny because we find a way to do that with city council folks and the mayor and, you know, the leaders of corporations very easily. We, we figure out the ethics of that very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to folks that don't have power, we seem to get all struggling struggling when it comes to that conversation. So go be in community and be a part of a community. Um, and I bet you it'd be a lot easier for you to find those sources outside of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Heather, yeah. Yeah, to, to, to the point that, that Farah was mentioning, this break that we have, I think you know the break that we're seeing is the one between journalism as a commercial industry selling units of information and journalism as a service to society. And we're going to have to pick one because we cannot save both. And only one of these has real utility. And the utility, I think, for us to continue doing this work and for us to build upon this work comes through collaboration and partnerships. We do not have the time or the means or the resources for competitive or repetitive waste to keep doing the same things over and over or trying to do them in competition with one another. Um, that's just, there's not the space for it. There's not the time for it. There's not the resources for it. We, we need to do this in partnership with one another. Um, the, you know, that's, that's, yeah, we, that's what I see. <laughs> I, I wanted to get to this point about the allergy of collab to collaboration that exists in an in a innately com um, competitive environment. But I'm glad that you gave me something to mull that competitive, get rid of the, co the repetitive competitive. It's a great one. Farah, your final word on this? Um, like I, I see a lot of collaborations and I, I'd love to, I'd love to keep in touch with everyone on this call. Yeah, and I just want to say that it was a real uh, it was a real privilege and honor for me to engage with you all in discussion. And I want to just make make a echo one final point that I think there are a lot of paths into journalism that we've discussed. And I don't want to dismiss. There's some people coming in the chat. You know, I studied literary studies, a small New England college. It wasn't Ivy, but it was a good school, Middlebury. And I think that gave me some tools that led to my first job. And the most important thing I had throughout my life was mentors good mentors that show me the way. And those mentors exist at Outlier Media or in Tiny News Collective or in the New York Times, they're everywhere. And so the key to every all my students on this call, come here, learn your data journalism skills, it's gonna help you. 
mm -hmm. um, and your multimedia and all that. And what is news and what is essential news? What is the word we were talking about? News you can move on, make the moves on, Candace. Utility, mm -hmm. news of utility. Actionable. And then we go into the world and we have impact. And that's the core of what we're teaching in this program. And I want to thank everybody who joined us today. And thank you to Mark Dizzuti for getting us up and running. And um, look forward to hearing from you all and staying in touch. All right.